Good morning from WKYT News. I'm Bill Bryant. We hope you're enjoying your weekend and we welcome you to Kentucky Newsmakers. As long as many people can remember, Ray Larson has been the long arm of the law in Lexington. He started as Fayette Commonwealth's attorney back in 1985. He spent more than three decades prosecuting criminals and standing up for crime victims. His approach has always been tough. Some have criticized him for that, but Larson has always said it is his office that makes the difference between the safety of residents and violent criminals running the streets. He has been very critical over the years of programs that released prisoners before they've done their time to save money. He told lawmakers that catch and release is for fish, not for criminals. Larson's stands and his willingness to travel and share his thoughts on social media have given him a national following as well. Well, now Ray Larson has decided it is time to step down as Lexington's top prosecutor. Today we're going to look back and look ahead with Ray the DA. Ray Larson, thank you very much for coming in. We appreciate it very much. I'm glad to be here. Uh, why have you decided <clears throat> that uh, now is the time to move on? A couple of reasons. Um, I never wanted to be the old man that hung around too long. And I had a birthday in all, middle of August and uh, I was 73 years old and I thought hmm I'm getting close to being that old man and my wife has been asking me to to hang it up for a while and I'm always interested in marriage maintenance so I'm, it's time you uh, had a bit of a health scare back uh, in the summer I did and <clears throat> I, I would take it that at least gave you some time to think about things, take some stock of life, and, and also see how the, the office uh, functioned without you there. Yes, I had, uh, I had a health issue in, in, I guess, February and March. And I'm over that now. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's just, this, this was part of the it's time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. mentality. Some may not realize that uh, you came to Lexington from uh, your native, uh, what, Washington State? Washington it, State. Yeah. Tell us about that, mm -hmm. how you got here and why you decided to stay. My, well, but it was a kind of a long trip to get here. My dad was in the military. <clears throat> I was born in Washington State. And we went from Washington, we went from Yakima, Washington to Missoula, Montana, to Fresno, California, to Tejon, Korea, to Patrick Air Force Base, to Eglin Air Force Base. My father came to the University of Kentucky to run the Air Force ROTC program. Then we were transferred to France, where I went to high school. <clears throat> and um, then he retired, and we, he was recruited to come back to the University of Kentucky. And so here we are. Glad you stayed. Oh, sure, yeah. Did you think about going elsewhere, you know, when you were uh, getting out of school and so forth? No, I didn't. This is, this is it. This was, I like Kentucky, I like Lexington. And I went to Paducah to practice law privately, and that's where... I was asked to be the uh, city prosecutor, and it was at that point that I, I thought, this is what I want to do. You know, my dad was kind of a strict guy, and he taught me that if you break the rules, you're going to suffer consequences right now. And that's kind of the philosophy I bring to this office. My dad gave me a uh, deep sense of right and wrong and people should be responsible for their behavior if you break the law you ought to suffer consequences and that's what we tried to do in our office the apple didn't fall <laughs> far from the tree you hope not <laughs> as uh, you uh, then you, you practice law you get this taste for prosecuting and then uh, 1984 governor martha lane collins appoints you as the fayette commonwealth's attorney she did and uh, i told her <clears throat> that it, that I would never embarrass her, and I don't think I have. 
And matter of fact, every time I see her, I say, have I embarrassed you yet? And she says, not yet, but I'm watching. <laughs> it probably still does. Mm -hmm. uh, so back then, let, first off, you, you go in, in in that era, there really was, in terms of numbers, there was more crime, uh, at least the, the, uh, you know, the, the stats are such. Uh, Lexington was a smaller place then. It has grown. But there were a lot of cases uh, that were quite intriguing as soon as you took office in the mid-1980s. Absolutely, and I'll tell you about those in a second. But <clears throat> remember, in the late 1960s, our criminal justice experts decided it wasn't the criminal's fault they committed crime. It was society's fault. And they decided not to send people to prison. Well, over the next... 10 or 15 years, the crime rate quadrupled and people became scared and they started telling legislators, we don't like living like this. And that was in 1984, our legislature passed a persistent felony offender law, which is basically three strikes and you're out and mandatory sentencing. And from that point, crime rates started dropping and they started putting these hoodlums back in in custody in, in prisons. Now that's what I that's what I was coming in at at the time that the crime rate was up and that these laws were starting to be passed and then we saw a dramatic drop. In nineteen eighty six, after I'd been in office for a year, we had twenty six homicides here in in Lexington. And that's a record that still stands. Yeah. It's I was here and covered most <clears throat> of them. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, then you'll remember the um, LaFonda Faye Foster, Tina Hickey Powell murder case. It became which they, known as the Full Moon Five. Yeah, uh, they yeah. killed five people one night. Um, then came the Michael Turpin case. Then just a lot of, of pretty high profile cases occurred pretty quickly in my tenure as prosecutor. We tried them, we convicted them, and um, good for us. Those were eye-opening cases, weren't they? they in, in like I said, they, they, they revealed some things going on in the community. They revealed that this uh, kind of violence uh, could happen uh, very quickly as well. Sure. I mean, in the, we became national news when we had five people killed. Um, so it's it and, and listen it's important if you commit the crime you suffer the consequences and fortunately we had we had juries that agreed with that and they convicted these outlaws and they're still in prison how often through the years did you feel that you knew something about a situation that you couldn't prove uh and uh, you know that you that you you knew that someone was guilty, but getting the evidence to uh, to bring about that case was uh, proved elusive. Uh, some, but <clears throat> here's we got kind of a we got kind of a rule in our office that if that if we're not convinced based on the evidence that a person committed the crime, uh, we believe it's immoral to go forward, and uh, we just demand that the evidence be there and the police department for the most part does a great job on these cases so um, I, I don't believe I've ever prosecuted or our office has ever prosecuted somebody that wasn't guilty uh, criminals of course will say that I'm full of crap on that but they're wrong uh, has technology improved evidence gathering uh, over the years well, sure. You know, and this is something most people don't know, Bill. <clears throat> it was our office prosecuting a case that resulted in a decision from the Supreme Court to allow DNA evidence in a criminal case. Um, before that, it wasn't allowed. And thanks to a case that our office handled, uh, we can now. Did, does it also, though, raise the bar for juries who expect that kind oh, of Oh, that's uh, the CSI effect is yeah. what you're talking yeah. about. Of course. They, uh, <clears throat> they watch these shows on television where they solve every murder in 42 minutes, 
and uh, got all of these magic tricks. And uh, a lot of times the magic tricks aren't real, but they demand now they want to see a fingerprint in almost every case. Well, you know, the reality is that fingerprints are found in only about 15% of the cases. They want DNA evidence. Uh, they want to see video tapes. And they're going to, you know, this, the, the, they're really going to start to see video evidence with these body cameras that the police department are wearing now. We're, we're starting to get cases where the body cam videos are coming in, and we, of course, provide them to the defense attorneys. Is that uh, going to help prosecution, do you think, or do you think it will help uh, defense attorneys as well? Well, you know, the defense attorneys are going to put their twist on what they're seeing, what people are seeing, and that's their job to do. Our job is to is to show the videos, and uh, I think videos will only help uh, juries. How often over the years did did juries surprise you? You you have put weeks, maybe months, into putting a case together. And those hours that you wait for the jury to come back uh, have to be, uh, uh, you know, you're on edge about that, I'm sure. Well, sure. <clears throat> um, one case in particular really surprised me because we worked very hard at the jury selection process. And the Donahue case, remember? Uh, um, where the police officer was run over by a guy named Glenn Donahue. Um, we thought we had a great case for uh, a guy intentionally running into and over uh, Brian Derman, <clears throat> killing him while he was on a traffic stop. And lo and behold, we had apparently had a juror that said she wasn't going to convict anybody of anything. And we just, that shocked us. Uh, they ended up convicting Donna High of manslaughter in second degree, but we thought we had this one. This, uh, jury selection is, is very key, isn't it? And, and, sure it is. and you're looking for all kinds of cues, I would take mm -hmm. it, when, uh, when those uh, potential jurors come into the room. What are the so, kinds of things you're looking for? Well, <clears throat> I can tell you right now that uh, I, don't I don't want lawyers on a jury because I, lawyers become critics. I'll tell you how I'd have done it, they think. <clears throat> I don't want um, retired or engineers because our burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, engineers don't go for this reasonable doubt stuff. They want a specific answer to every issue. And I would never select my wife. <laughs> <laughs> as a juror, she's a retired school teacher, and she thinks uh, if only every kid had been taught to read in third grade, we wouldn't have this problem. And so I'd say, Betty, no thanks. <laughs> yeah. You you'll hear a defense attorney say that they even will try to observe the vehicles that uh, people drove mm -hmm. in in, and and maybe how they're dressed and this sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, but th you know what that's called. Profiling. And what a bad term in criminal justice is profiling, except you do it every day when you select a jury. You're profiling. I profile when I say lawyers are out <laughs> because I don't want them to sit around and say, you know, I'd be better at this than that Larson kid. Yeah. <laughs> Still calling yourself a kid. That's yeah, that's good. right. We are back with Ray Larson in just a moment on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers, and we're going to ask him a lot more, including uh, how he feels that law is enforced in the Commonwealth. Back in a moment. Welcome back in to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers as we visit with Ray Larson, who will be leaving as the Fayette Commonwealth's attorney at the uh, end of the month. He uh, made that decision earlier in the month and announced it uh, to us. Uh, I wonder, did, did you have any idea that, uh, you, that you would stay in the position as long as you have when you uh, entered the office in 1985? I never thought about it. <clears throat> I just never thought about it. Um, I got, my dad has driven into me over the years um, that if you violate the rules, you suffer consequences right now. 
and uh, he was kind of a straight arrow. And I have really enjoyed uh, that. I really don't spend a lot of time worrying about the criminals. Um, I just, they kind of put themselves in the position. But you hear the pre-sentencing report and mm -hmm. you know the, the, what may have gone on in their lives and so forth and that, you say, does not move you. You see, know. their rights end where your rights begin. A person that a person does not have a right to punch you in the nose, you see. Now, what people forget is victims are not volunteers for the criminal justice system. They are picked by some hoodlum who decides they're going to they're going to violate their rights. They become crime victims. And crime victims in Kentucky are bill are treated like crap. They continue to be treated that way and that's one of the things that really offends me about our system is the for example the Turpins lost Michael they lost their son Michael to a, a murder now they have a life sentence of sadness that's what they have these punks that killed him will serve a, some sort of a sentence in prison and then get out and go on their way leaving the victims, survivors of homicide victims, in a pile. There's something wrong with that. And um, I don't like it. What would you like to see done that uh, might reform that? Well, I think people, first of all, they ought to serve the sentences that they're given instead of uh, c coming up with all these hocus-pocus magic tricks that let people out almost immediately are not sent in the first place. Uh, that concerns me. Um, and I know about all of this. We can't afford to uh, incarcerate everybody, but nobody has ever looked at the financial costs of crime as compared to the incarceration But rate. you have. You bet, you bet your rear end I have, and I'm going to talk about it sometime, but uh, right now I'm not going to do that, but it's coming. You uh, bypassed uh, uh, chances to run for attorney general or to climb the political ladder. There were those mm -hmm. who uh, encouraged you over the years. I'm aware of that. And uh, some talked about running for mayor, this uh, kind of thing. Uh, did any of that ever appeal to you? Did you think about it? No. <clears throat> I thanked them for their, uh, I appreciated the confidence they had in me, but I'd be a lousy legislator, which is what a mayor is. Which, you know, you know. bottom line is, in our office, we spend a lot of time considering decisions we make. And if, if I was a legislator and I had a great idea and got it all put together, in order to get everybody's vote, you got to water it down, do what they want, include what they want in it and kind of compromise. In our business, juries do the compromising, and uh, that's their job. So I, I'd probably be pretty lousy as a legislator, and I know it. I know what my skill set is, and I know where I belong. Uh, drugs, how mm -hmm. much has that been part of what you have done in oh, your office? Oh, huge. Drugs are drugs probably involved in 75 to 80 percent of the cases that we do um, and uh, a person is can get on drugs and go and burglarizes somebody's house just to get money to buy drugs well let's go back to the rule just because they have made the decision to use drugs does not give them to violate another person's rights and break into their house and steal things that they've worked hard to obtain. Burglars are, that's a trashy crime. I mean, think, think about it. Uh, you work hard to obtain things and some no-count punk decides they're coming in your house to steal your stuff. Disgusting. The recent uh, wave of <clears throat> overdoses is uh, certainly disturbing. It's uh, getting national attention at this point. Why is Kentucky uh, such a marketplace for illicit drugs? I don't know, but it is. Um, it's 
I'll tell you what one of the things I've heard is that a lot of criminals come in out of, from out of state because the penalties for getting caught peddling this poison are not as harsh as in other states. Um, I haven't made a comparison between the, the penalty ranges in, in various states, but that's one of the things that some of these uh, dope dealers say. What do you say, and you, you talked about the, the drug issue in Kentucky, what do you say to those who say that we cannot incarcerate ourselves out of this drug problem that Kentucky has got to face up and do uh, and provide more treatment uh, for those who uh, suffer addiction? <clears throat> I go to the grocery store periodically, and I'll bet you every other trip to the grocery store, somebody will come up to me and beg me to do what I can to throw their child into jail <clears throat> because that's the only good night's sleep they get is when they're incarcerated. If, Bill, if you were a, a heroin addict and you went into jail and then got right out on bond <clears throat> and the judge says, I want you to be in uh, drug treatment, I can't talk to you because you're still basically high and maybe addicted. It takes some time to get you dried out so we can talk some sense to you. I believe that when you're dealing with uh, addicts that they need to go into custody for a designated period of time, let them dry out and begin uh, drug treatment program in custody. That's what I think. Do we put enough resources <clears throat> into providing then that uh, treatment after the fact? No. I mean that, no. That hasn't, that hasn't happened. Uh, Here's what we say. We're going to put you on probation. We're going to drug test you and go out there and heal yourself. Well, that's not going to work. Um, that's why they're there in the first place. They're addicted to this poison. Some localities are, are, are wrestling with uh, building detention facilities that are also, you know, a hybrid. They're also a, a treatment facility. Is that uh, where we need to go? I think every incarceration facility ought to be a treatment facility. That's where you, you, you got them. You're going to dry them out. That's where treatment starts. What do you think of these the overdose situation that you've oh, seen over the last few weeks? It is absolutely scary. Um, it's really scary. That, and, I don't, and, and as much media attention has happened to this, it doesn't seem to be stopping it. Um, you know, the threat of death it ought to be pretty scary to people, and it's the addiction is stronger than the fear. So uh, right now we just, uh, our goal is to get them to go get treatment. Most of these addicts don't want treatment. They want to continue to use dope. Some say they're not in a position to make the judgment <clears throat> that they need treatment, uh, that, that, that they have, they're so altered. Uh, well, but so what are you going to do? Yeah. Tell them to voluntarily go out there and get treatment, <clears throat> doesn't work. Put them in custody, <clears throat> keep them there until, until they're dried out and then begin the treatment process. With Ray Larson, the Fayette Commonwealth's attorney who retires at the end of the month. Our remaining moments with him. In just a moment, we'll ask him what he plans to do after he leaves this uh, powerful position he's held since 1985. Kentucky Newsmakers will be right back. Okay. Welcome back in to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. We're visiting with Ray Larson, Ray the DA, who has decided that he will be hanging it up as the uh, prosecutor in Fayette County at the end of this month. You've built a national profile. Uh, you, you've been active on social media through the years and uh, have uh, visited uh, with other young prosecutors around the country. Uh, what do you plan to do? Are you going to continue to uh, mentor young people uh, when you're finished, or do you have some other missions? I'm going to continue to be an advocate 
for responsibility for behavior. And I'm going to continue to blog. That's a Facebook um, thing. And I'm going to do those kind of, I'll be active, but I'm also a grandfather and I got three grandkids that I really like. And right now they still like me. They will until, I'm, until they're teenagers and they'll throw me under the bus. Well, they think you're too strict. I hope. Yeah, that's part of the deal. <laughs> do you, uh, do you, will you uh, occasionally maybe go to Frankfurt if you find something that you feel needs to be uh, addressed? You know, I don't know. Going to Frankfurt is not much fun. It's, uh, if you're a politician, it's probably fun. I'm not a politician, and one of the things we've tried very hard to do in our office is keep politics out. There's no room in a prosecutor's office for political influence. And we have avoided that and in the process of pretty much we've ticked people off. I've lost friends <coughs> because they want their kid treated differently and it isn't going to happen. The governor uh, appoints your replacement. Mm -hmm. You hope he chooses wisely. I do. I really do because it's... Uh, the prosecutor's office is very important and provides kind of uh, leadership in this area of crime fighting. Ray Larson, thank you. Good luck to you. Thanks, Bill. I know we'll see you around. Oh, you bet. Thank you. We appreciate you joining us for this edition of Kentucky Newsmakers on WKYT. We'll see you bright and early on WKYT this morning, and you make it a good week ahead.